Welcome everyone. So good to be here again with you. This is an inquiry and a conversation about technology. So technology is all around us in so many forms. There are those that we are aware of and those that we are unaware of. We call these invisible architectures and they have a powerful influence on us and not always generative as we know. There are those technologies that really serve us and those that do not. What is important for us is that the more we become conscious of how to design technologies and technology ecosystems for an all-win culture, the more we are liberated into our true freedom and true sovereignty. This sovereignty, this full spectrum human dignity must be fully embodied and the technology must be coming from a consciousness that can support our evolution as individuals, as a species and in our social systems. Imagine if we designed technologies that were aligned with the principles of life and living systems holistic design and biomimicry, where we are served in who we are becoming in more of our social potential. This is a vision I have. I live inside of this question and vision. We have been so long under the spell of an impressive tech infrastructure bombarding us from all sides that we don't even fully recognize how repressed and limited we have been in these waters, it's like the frog in the pan as the water is slowly heating up. It doesn't jump out even when it's boiling. That's us. Our opportunity, however, that's here, is we are becoming more aware and conscious enough to say now, we want our technologies to serve all life and nothing less, including our media technologies, which are everywhere, all these big tech companies. Do you know that the airwaves are owned by the people? That's a pretty interesting fact to contemplate, at least in the United States. So this next conversation is all about technology that serves life and our social potential and technology designed from a beautiful state of consciousness that is taking into account the whole and the part and the one and the many. This is like a wisdom driven civilization. Can you imagine? So my guest is Adam Apollo, who I've known since 2007 and I have been tracking what he's working on since then. This is actually our first interview, and I'm so excited. You're going to hear how we met, which was a wonderful context with a group of extraordinary people. We were using open space technology, one of my favorite social technologies, and inquiring into platforms that can serve a wiser commons. Wiser commons was the beginning of what became Wiser Earth, a project initiated by Paul Hawken. And that was the direct result of his book, Blessed Unrest, which was tracking the movement around the world, essentially the humanity's immune system. So Adam was one of the participants and was already working on some cutting edge technology that is even now being brought into greater form in our time of need. So perfect timing, in time, on time. Adam is a very unique and awake human, and he has offered insights on global transitions, physics, technology, human spirituality, and the future as a next generation leadership ambassador at the White House in multiple nexus and other summits at the United Nations and at conferences and festivals around the world. He served as Chief of Business Development for the 2020 Fund and organized two prayer runs for world peace with Indigenous elders and youth 
from all over North America. He is a co-founder of the Unify Movement, which has reached over a hundred million people. And he has founded two education and technology-based companies, Access Granted and Superliminal Systems. He's an active faculty member, author, and the lead systems architect for several international online academies, including the Resonance Academy for Unified Physics, the Guardian Alliance Academy for Self Mastery, with over 100,000 active students of all ages from around the world across these schools. It's really amazing. And now, He's building a decentralized social operating system that has a revolutionary 3D Starship dashboard, and you're going to hear all about it, and a regenerative impact engine for gamification of planetary transformation. Adam is dedicated to achieving a sustainable and thriving interplanetary culture. I believe that this technology that we're going to be talking about that he's been developing for years can ignite some of the visions that have been foreseen for some time and that have been needing the conditions conducive for their imagination and manifestation. That imagination has been necessary to seed the soil in order for the manifestation to come fully into form and it's time. I believe that we are at that precipice. So allow yourself to imagine the highest possible future for our technologies at this critical juncture of life. Thank you for being with us. Okay, welcome, Adam. I'm so happy that you're here. Thank you. So good to be here with you, Sherry. <laughs> yes, yeah, so we haven't been in a conversation for a while, and certainly not uh, publicly. I don't think you were one of my guests on my last podcast. So oh, I must have missed that. Um, so I must but, not have invited you. <laughs> uh, that's okay. I mean, you and I have known each other for, I don't know, 15 years or something uh, at this point. Um, yes, maybe 10. Early, no, yes, definitely. Since the early days of Unify when Martine and I, I think, went up there. Oh, no. 2007 at the yeah. Wiser Commons. You got it. That's it. So yeah, 15 years, like I said, Wiser Thank Commons. Thank you, Katrina. <laughs> Thank you, Katrina, Katrina. What an yes. amazing being that woman is. Yes, that was a really fun moment. We could talk about that some other time, but sure. that takes us into other domains. So um, I'm really excited about this conversation for a number of reasons. Um and I'll, I'll just choose one as the entry point in, which we'll cover a lot because we're definitely in a multidimensional, um, highly potentialized uh, space of what's, what's possible on the earth now. And your role in kind of the leading edge, evolutionary edge of technology seems to be a, a really key piece with also your, I would say your integrity and I experience you with a and impeccability and watching your own growth over many years. And so technology is having a huge influence in our lives right now. And a lot of it with the unenlightened algorithms, let's say, and <laughs> you are definitely leaning us and moving us towards enlightened algorithms and um, what can actually serve humanity at this moment in the greatest way. So that's how I, um, I think of you in that this role. So I really want to be able to kind of name that kind of out uh, up front. And then before we dive into that terrain, I want to hear a little bit more about your background, like, because everyone has these personal stories of kind of what then got them here to being holding this particular piece of the puzzle yeah. in this global architecture. Sure. Um, and thank you. I, uh, I certainly have an ambition to bring more enlightened structures to the planet and I'm doing my best in service to that. Um, I think a lot of people know my backstory in discovering energy, realizing as a teenager that we're interconnected as part of the universe. And a lot of people know that I 
started remembering past lives when I was in college and that that's been a big part of my journey and a lot of my more spiritual and esoteric side, but I don't usually tell the background for why I'm doing what I'm doing right now, which is the technological side of this vision. And it really started when I was, I think, 17 and I was at a friend of mine's house named Tayo. And we started just talking about how it is that we connect with each other. How do people connect? Why do people connect? And what makes us feel connected with each other at a bigger level? And, you know, he and I both had had a lot of travel experience. So we both had friends in different places or our parents moved. My parents moved a lot growing up. So um, I had scattered people that I knew and not really any tangible, clear way to keep up with them. This was just prior to the age of really cell phones becoming a big thing. I didn't get my first cell phone for, you know, a couple of years after that in college and uh, late nineties. And we had this conversation that became this idea that was an online technology that we called connections. And the idea was like, if you could somehow strengthen and enable the connections that you have with people to be present with you online, um, syncing you up, letting you communicate, letting you plan events together, letting you, you know, do and, and create things and see how everybody is connected to each other. Um, then it would change the world. Now, my space just basically started baking not too long after that. And it was really a junk show. You know, you go to my space pages and, you can't even absorb the content because people have filled it with animated GIFs and loud backgrounds and bright colored text. And it didn't have enough constraints to the design to keep it coherent enough to be interesting yet, you know, millions and millions of people used MySpace. Um, personally, in the years after that, I got interested in tribe.net and I was using tribe.net in the early two thousands, especially as I started traveling around the country to be deeply connecting with people and having some way to stay connected with them wherever they were and whatever they were doing. Um, and it was as, you know, tribe.net was failing and Facebook began to really get its rise that I had this profound galactic experience where I came into contact with beings from other worlds. And as a scientist, as a philosopher, as, you know, I consider myself to be a very grounded person. I have a Virgo moon and I question everything. I process everything. I go through logic with everything. Um, this experience completely transformed my life uh, and, and took me to, required me to adapt a higher level of perspective. And the experience also triggered a series of events where I began to see what it looks like to maintain connection and communication at a galactic scale. And I began to have these visions of, of interfaces, experiences within a space of technology, but that are not just screen, that are screen and AR and VR, um, immersive, holographic. And the interfaces I began to see, essentially, I realized what I was seeing was a way that you could create visual experiences that augment consciousness in understanding itself better. Meaning, you know, if we look into psychology, we see lots of ways that people go into learning, right? Some people learn better with text. Some people learn better with visuals. But the reality is there are fundamental principles to how the brain learns, operates, and interacts with things. And in the last, you know, couple decades, what we've seen is a huge amount of abuse of that in the marketing sector, in the social media sites that have been built up, the social dilemma, the great hack, all of these psychological manipulative ways of trying to get people to do what other people want them to do, right? And what I was really touching into is how do people empower themselves to see and understand more and have more sovereignty and have more choice? And that foundation planted literally in the days when we met 
Um, I was having these visions in 2005, 2006 and seven. And I have, you know, the old drawings of the original geometric and harmonic interfaces designed to augment consciousness are now finally what technology has matured enough for me to build and, and myself and my team. Um, so that's a little bit of my journey to the year. I love that. I love that I was part of the early days. That that was that was a little bit of a momentous uh, gathering with Paul Hawken and uh, really looking Indeed. at some of the that was the 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 baseline of a wiser earth. And I'd come mm-hmm. out of my own passion around platforms and technology with indie media, which was open source, right. open publishing, and um, empowering people to tell their own stories, basically. And so. Um, Oh, that's really cool. I'm glad to hear that little piece of sort of that more esoteric, but also how the the galactic is like weaving in with uh, what is needed to remind ourselves of that we are all interconnected because we know that we're leaving the age of separation to the age of you know unity or interbeing or all these different ways synergy. of yes yeah, synergy synergy Ooh, mm-hmm. hopefully we can get to the synergy engine and the peace <laughs> room that, that's coming up um so yeah so if we look at like i just want to frame something for everybody listening and watching is that um, we're in a chaos moment. Some people like urban laszlo talk about it as a chaos window it's like a bifurcation the old world is really dying and collapsing and struggling to kind of stay within that old degenerative operating system built on a different level of consciousness, right? So we're at this moment of like consciously choosing and a new operating system, and it has to come in from inside. So before we get into some more of the external things you named, you had to get into your own level of, of mastery, And I've been saying this for a long time. I'm like, we could do it. We could do it. We're not yet at this level of our own mastery. Oh, it's so close. Oh, it's so close. (laughs) We don't, we need, and I can feel those things in fields. I'm very aware of like the gestalt. And so I want us to feel like we're at a different precipice as humanity and Mm -hmm. that we, many of us who are in service to all life, with these technologies are not in it for ourselves alone because that would be super boring and that's not the whole point the point is the connective tissue i mean who wants to do that right i know i need a field around me that Mm -hmm. is lifting me up to the next level of the synergistic upward quantum spiral so just a little bit of a taste of what some of that mastery is that has helped you with your own states of perception and that these levels of consciousness that are no longer states, but actually sufficient enough to like land as a stage where we're actually, oh, I can embody this and bring it into form because that's a very high level of mastery. Mm -hmm. Well, it's all about relationship, isn't it? I mean, everything is relationship. Everything that we interact with, do, create, are in the universe is based on relationships. And even when you're alone, everything is based on your relationship with everything else. Although you may be resisting or rejecting certain kinds of relationships in order to maintain that aloneness. Um, And so, you know, I think that for myself, a lot of the, the journey has been understanding relationship and understanding relationship with myself and others and partners and how I go about my life and live my life. And it makes sense because, you know, when I woke up when I was 15, the realization was that there is this field that we are all immersed in and this field of force and energy emanates from our bodies. You know, it's been called ki, chi, and prana, and vital force, and life force, and odic force, and, you know, the quantum vacuum, quantum vacuum fluctuations, uh, lately the Higgs field, although that's kind of like a bastardization of it. All of these things are essentially this field of force and flow and vibration in which we are in. And the beautiful key that arises when we start getting in touch with this foundational structure of space-time is that you don't stop being 
in vibrational relationship with the things around you and the people that you know when you're by yourself, that in fact, parts of you have created entanglement with the materia of other beings and thus created uh, pipelines, not just, you know, higher plane pipelines, uh, as you may say in metaphysics, like etheric or astral or cathetic links with others, but you've actually created physical as above, so below, um, pipelines with people to exchange data and information. And, you know, what I'm really saying here is that, you know, moms can feel their kids when they're outside and one of them hurts themselves. Uh, Good friends pick up on each other's thoughts, feel each other, think about each other, text each other at the same time. We have a lot of supportive, you know, elements to this. And this field that's instantaneously synchronizing and interconnecting and synergizing and driving us towards and through transformations in relationship to achieve greater synergy is like a current that we're either in or we're in resistance to. And that current is part of our deepest will, our deepest choice and our deepest destiny. So learning how to essentially navigate that current and understand connection and differentiation, understand what stuff is ours and what stuff may be the collectives that we are culturally entangled with in different ways and being able to separate the two. And, you know, essentially working with this field of interconnection we have is really the primer to getting towards planetary stewardship, because that's what we want to do, right? We want to be together. We want to take care of this planet together and we want to hopefully serve all life. Right. And so that's, that's really been at the heart of the journey is this capacity building Mm -hmm. around how we work with this subtle field in the way that it also defines and develops our ability to see and understand each other. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Beautifully said. Adam. Yeah, I can just feel that. I can feel the wholeness that we actually are sitting inside of that, as you were saying, you know, we can either receive it. I mean, life is, I live at the end of a road in a cabin in a forest, you know, so it's like this, hello, trees. And I'm, I mean, I breathe with the trees every morning consciously. We have a, Mm. a thing And it's, let me tell you, there is air quality difference and there is communion and there is information flow that more and more I can tune into, you know, as like, you know, we're really, uh, as we become more harmonious with life and the principles of living systems, life is teaching us all the time. And we're just cleansing and purifying ourselves from these old patterns and these old programmings. And which is why I'm, I'm really, I don't, I'm not giving you, I'm not praising you for the sake of saying, oh, Adam, it's more like thanking you for the work you've done to get yourself to listen enough to be at this place, to be in stewardship and intentionality around this, the technology that's the exterior technology to support this kind of inner collective awareness coming up to another level. So uh, super juicy, we could, you know, if we had three hours, we would dive into that part and that would be so fun. Let's have part two. Um, okay. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> um, but let's get into the technology um, because you have a lot of insights around the kind of the current web three, kind of the issues with web one and two and kind of insufficient to actually address what we actually need with like this kind of um, regenerative um, um, technology technology regenerative technology for the stewardship in a collective way. And also the technology that, you know, if we could take all the current um, social media things that are doing harm, and the more we learn about it, the more we're like, whoa, um, that if we like flipped it, we would be like, oh, this is for our highest good. This is to connect the right people. This is to like synergize. Oh, it's so elegant. It feels so good. I feel better. I'm finding my right placement. I'm being seen. My gifts are being welcomed. There's flows of energy and resources and all that. 
that this is a cusp that we're on. And I really see you as holding like a key catalyst um, role in that. So I'd love you to kind of walk us into the, the, you know, as an evolutionary catalyst in this moment, like the technology that you've been developing for 15 years, if not like your entire life. Sure. Yeah, sure. You know, I think it helps people to kind of get a little bit of a sense of of the journey that we've been on in technology. So I'll speak to the web one, two and 3.0 piece a little bit. Um, you know, web 1.0 is is what we had in the 90s and, you know, into uh, early 2000s, which is still is prominent. And really, you know, a lot of the web is basically uh publishing it's essentially like i have a blog i have a thing i write i put stuff online people read it cool right i now have information being shared and you know the heart of that is i store that information on a website on a centralized server and that server distributes that information to everybody and and the more people that look at it, the more it challenges that server because the more people are connecting to that computer at the same time right? Web 2.0 magnifies that problem because in Web 2.0, it's not just about uh, me serving you data. It's about us serving each other data. This is the rise of the social network era, the MySpaces and tribes and Facebooks of the world, right? Metas, whatever it is. Um, <laughs> and, and when you start having bi-directional communication, now it's just, it's people pinging a server, servers giving data back to people, people giving data back to servers, and it goes back and forth more and more. Um, essentially, you know, there's more and more weight on these servers. And this has given rise to the age also of massive server farms, you know, where Google and Facebook and others, you have like these massive underground caverns with just thousands and thousands of computers and servers all interconnected, all just like sucking down more energy than entire towns or cities, you know. This is like um, a, I want to say this for a moment here because sure. that's like a scene from a movie. You know? mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, we've seen some of those scenes in some of those movies, but it's yeah. like you just saying that to me here, just have a moment for people to kind of get that image that that is currently going on in terms of the invisible structures that are, as you said, sucking down energy, which we know Bitcoin versus Ethereum versus Holochain versus whatever's coming. There's a, yeah. I just heard Mark Kane tell me about this math person, I'm sure she shared it with her, but like, oh, mm. sacred geometry math and mm. what happens with like, oh, 32 million interactions in like a second versus five minutes for one. You know, you're like, where? Mm -hmm. So mm. just mm -hmm. land that a little bit because we yeah. all are like trying to be regenerative and right relationship with life and energy. Yeah, well, I love that you mentioned these crypto projects because that's the, you know, another step that I was going to go to. Good. Essentially, in this same era of massive server farms and centralized applications, the the other massive problem, well, let's just say first, Bitcoin arose in that those days too. Um, and Bitcoin's design is absolutely brilliant and still it it has one massive flaw. And that flaw is that when someone tries to give somebody else money, that monetary exchange has to then be updated in all the ledgers of all the computers of everybody that holds a Bitcoin wallet in the entire world. That's like, imagine, Sherry, if I hand you $100 and we're like, OK, cool. Are we done? Nope, not at all. OK, push the thing on your phone. And now your phone calls all the other phones doo -doo 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 -doo, and updates all of it to make sure that my $100 is real and is not duplicated. And, can and be everybody given to who it. touched that dollar bill. Yeah, well, it's and it's just not how real life works at all. Right. And so, you know, this this it, by the way, Bitcoin uses almost as much energy as all. Actually, I think it's now more than this amount. This was in 2019. This was the numbers. But in 2019, Bitcoin used almost as much energy as all of the massive largest world banks combined all their branches, all their ATMs everything 
like more than all of those facilities combined. Now, by the way, these are, I'm talking about skyscrapers in like almost every city, right? You know, you right. can you can imagine. Right. Um, and so, so there is a bottleneck to this global ledger, just as much as there's bottlenecks to centralized server farms. And Ethereum is a great example of that too, because what you're essentially saying is all of you can build apps on Ethereum, but you all have to try to save your data to the same ledger. You got to all get your piece in, your block in, and in order to do that, when there's hundreds of thousands to millions of transactions competing for that next block, the cost and the energy use is ridiculous mm -hmm. just to get the next thing saved in the ledger. Mm -hmm. And so that's all still really parts of the Web 2 problem, even though we think of Bitcoin and Ethereum as Web 3. They still right. are operating with the same uh, basic mentality of there's got to be this one final source of truth, right? And we really see the issues of that spill over into the kinds of issues that we see in the social dilemma and the great hack and centralized systems, essentially kind of aggregating the control and force over the data that they've received, learning what everybody wants and needs and being able to essentially manipulate them as desired, you know, and throttle them, keep them from reaching their audiences, force them to pay for marketing spend. Um, there's a great series out on Amazon Prime now called, um, it's on Showtime actually, but I'm watching it on Prime, um, called Super Pumped. And it's it's really the dark, dark underbelly story of what happened behind Uber. And seeing the ways that they abused those rights to spy straight through people's phones and their cameras and their 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 microphones to know what their drivers are doing and what their pain points are and be able to manipulate that um, is just disgusting. And so we, we've all seen or probably heard of a lot of those problems. Now, Web3 has seemingly been this recent, oh my gosh, Web3 is happening. But we were talking about Web3 in 2007 in Wiser Commons. And the original concepts of Web3 were actually about how the internet is based on language and our communication is based on language. And so how do we make the internet more semantic? How do we recognize meaning in all of this data and information, which was really our, like this. Our, yeah, no, go ahead. Going. I'm just excited about that. How we create meaning <laughs> from the information flows and relevancy. We know we've heard, you yeah. know, how are we actually creating those kind of filters that can support us in seeing what's emergent and relevant and nurturing the fundamental conversations as we are sense making. That's right. That's right. And meaning making is something that causes us to go into a space of better understanding each other and understanding ourselves, right? So the initial flags for Web3 were really about this sort of augmentation of consciousness, which is what I was so deeply inspired to explore, you know, in the years before that. And, you know, it has in some ways maintained that itself as the foundation for what I believe real Web3 projects are actually all about, which is that when you start understanding that meaning is what's important, you start realizing that people's perspectives on that meaning, their individual agency in interacting with that data, in other words, if I use a more technical phrase to describe it, is actually what's most important. And so, you know, many years ago, back back in those days when I met you is also when I met Arthur Brock mm -hmm. and Art and Eric, you know, had this vision of this project Scepter and, you know, it didn't didn't really even get fleshed out for, for you know, until a decade ago or so. And then and then from Scepter came out this one particular piece of this you know, revolutionary vision for how we change operating data altogether, the entire computing system. Mm -hmm. And that piece is now called Holochain. And Holochain essentially takes the stance that 
the existing blockchain and Web3 so-called infrastructure is actually faulty. It's faulty because of the centralization of the ledger. And that means that, like, you know, everybody's got to validate. Everybody's got to validate everything. But in real life, going back to our $100 bill exchange, in real life, what happens is I know you are who you say you are because I'm looking at you basically, usually, you know, or whatever. And or I can validate that your identity is your identity. You can validate mine is mine. I give you a $100 bill and you look at the $100 bill and you can tell it's a real $100 bill. And if you take it to the bank, they will cash it. So the because that hundred dollar bill has its minting encoded in it, right? And so this is the way that Holochain works. It says actually all you need is the record of identity. That's my record of identity, your record of identity, and the record of identity of the token that we're exchanging. Mm -hmm. And that's all we need to do the transaction. Nobody else even has to know. And when you go take it to the bank, which is like a Holochain app, that app can essentially verify for you. Yes, absolutely. This We can track the chain of this token back to its origin. Yes, that identity is correct. So HAPs can be these sort of mediators and validated service units. Um, but the real deal is just you and me. And the energy use is like nothing, right? And, and we maintain our own perspective on that exchange and that data, which is really powerful when we start looking past financial currencies, mm -hmm. because we live in a world where financial currencies are not the only kind of currency we're operating in. In fact, most relationship is built off of trust currency, mm -hmm. not financial currency. I don't make a financial deal unless I've built trust with someone. So we can say that the trust currency is actually superior and transcendent to the fiscal currency, mm. right? We, we do fiscal exchanges based on the lattice of our trust relationships, or at least that's the way it should be because some things like the stock exchange right now, it's all just like, oh, it's going up, it's going down, I'm betting on that, which is ridiculous. It's almost yeah. insanity. Yeah. That that's the way we're operating with our money, just based on who else is buying and who else yeah. is selling with yeah. zero trust necessarily in the organizations, zero like, um, you know, uh, real accountability and accreditation and all of these things. And it was it was the realization of that error that was part of the formulation of something that Harlan initially brought to me, which he called the trust exchange. Mm -hmm. And Harlan is my CTO and co-chairman at Superluminal Systems. We love Harlan. Harlan is um, um, a very special being. And, and uh, I love that, that, that the trust. Uh, so you've just named Superluminal Systems. So I want to like flag that. And, um, and also trust, because if we're talking about meaning making, because ultimately it's like, what is technology serving us to do? You know, mm -hmm. um, I want to make sure we touch on the peace room, but I, I really, and also I want to hear your perspective on DAOs, this kind of idea that we're in a DAO okay. moment, because, you know, I've been a social architect an evolutionary social architect for a long time since the early 2000s, as I started looking at like, well, how do we actually make change happen if we don't have good governance structures mm -hmm. and ways of communicating and flowing and trusting and all that, we and process, sitting in circle together, making decisions, working through issues, we're, we're not going to get to like the technology is going to solve our problem. You know, it's like it has to be an yeah. intimate relationship. Um, and then, of course, with the energy, with the field itself, this like right. field, this field. And also, so I loved hearing that, that riff on Holochain because, you know, I've been in that Holochain field for a long time. And I remember being with Eric harris Braun and Fernanda and Fernanda and other people at the Open Money Mexico Intensive and in, in back in 2007 or something and Jean-Francois Nubel and collective intelligence, you know, it was collective intelligence was up in our field of like, oh, how are we doing this? How is yeah. the technology serving this? So um, we know that trust is this essential piece of it. And you've touched on it a couple of times. And now with the mm -hmm. trust uh, network and the trust graph, talk us like where you are with that technology that can actually facilitate this kind of these kinds of. And I want to say one more thing and then you can see what mm -hmm. what emerges 
is around, um, and this was also with um, uh, Eric and others, was around the Wealth um, Acknowledgement System, WAS. So at the center of this giant map of everything that is energy and, and can be exchanged, we play, we have money and it's this dot in the center. Mm -hmm. And then there's all the other aspects of wealth, you know, our reputation, our ways of being, how we nurture life, how we, how we give, how we serve, how all the things I feel like I have, like, I am so wealthy because yes. of all of that, <laughs> but we don't make it visible. So let's hear you share a little bit about that. Yeah, I love I love your presencing of that because it's so true. Our our wealth is so much more than our the currency that we're holding in our pockets. Um and it's not to say that that piece isn't important because yeah. it's yeah. energy and it's exchanging yeah. energy, it's creating things. Um but we we have to open our perspective to the wider gamut. Um, just as business moved to like, you know, more bottom lines than the black line, you know, of the, of the ledger, so to speak, that's where, you know, you've got profit or loss, like as if that's the only thing that actually matters in the company, like actually what else is going on? You know, what kind of benefits is the company creating? What kind of environmental and social work is happening there? You know, what are, what are all the other layers of what's occurring within a company or a system that we need to account for. And that's one of the really powerful and beautiful things that technology affords us. And this is, you know, I, I have friends, I have some friends who, you know, literally hold the perspective that uh, technology all has to fall for us to get to the next stage. And we need to all just go back to like being on arm and like not using it. And, and I look at them and I'm saying, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> Like that's a fascinating vision, but what you're basically asking for is destruction of everything you can imagine. Like the, you're, you're literally calling for the most massive wipeout of human creativity and, and probably life on the planet that, that we could even imagine to go back that far because people are growing and evolving and we're constantly learning new things and developing new tricks and new systems and I'm much more a Buckminster Fuller guy, where I believe that transcending and including is the key, which means we're not going to lose tech, but how do we start operating with technology in a way that gives us the power to understand and see all the pieces of the puzzle that we're dealing with that actually augments us in stewardship and management of those resources, right? So what does that all come down to? Well, it all basically, you know, hits the ground at the level of the trust currency. And, you know, our journey in trust exchange to now what's called Trust Graph, which is an open source project, which we're in dialogue with groups like the Blue Sky community around implementation of Trust Graph as a foundational, integrative, uh, relational system and reputation system, essentially, that can be part of the foundation of all of these different decentralized and web three projects and stitch them together is, is actually about understanding that in relationships and in dynamics with each other in real life, it's not one to five stars. Whenever you're interacting with something, you're not actually ever just saying this is good or this is bad. You don't. Human psychology and our beings don't do that. We What we do is we say, well, the food was pretty good at that restaurant, but boy, that service was kind of crap. Um, but I really liked their bathrooms. Those were nice. And the area of town, you know, it was okay. Like it was a little bit of a commute to get there. Like we have all of these different data points and each of these different data points and frames have different levels of our reputation or trust that we're giving to those things to let other people see what's good and bad about a certain situation. And relationships are even more complex than things like restaurants because they're, you know, you might have a particular friend or something and they maybe hold a certain belief or a certain idea, or they've, you know, gone down a certain rabbit hole that makes you really question 
their, you know, their integrity or question, you know, their, um, their logic around certain kinds of things. And I'm sure plenty of people question my logic just because I talk about, you know, galactic species and past lives and spiritual development. However, you know, if they actually listen and pay attention and, or have a conversation with me, they'll discover that those are all developed frameworks in me based on years and years of logic and experience and direct things that I had to build a framework for explanation around, mm -hmm. you know, it's not, not just like out of the blue. Mm -hmm. And so we, we need to that's look in our relationships. An important, I want you to pick up right there, yeah, but an important sure. point for people of like, these things don't emerge because they're theoretical out there, or we believe something just because that does happen. But the yeah. integrity of actually direct experience of yeah. something, I have the same sort of story of like these things, how do I explain them? I can't even talk to anybody about them, you know, right. and then right. over time we make sense of it because we are much more vast than we actually realize. And so we need those kinds of walls of perception to be broken down. So yes. I wanted to just yes. affirm that for people and for your own, when you're in the mystery of not knowing, that's okay. Because- yeah. If you're not willing to look at the not knowing, you're not going to get very far with your own growth of, of what's happening on the planet and what's right. possible on the planet. Right. Absolutely. And I love that you interjected there because you're pointing to something really, really essential and what, what I was in the middle of sharing, which is that in our relationship field, we have to start to really recognize that sometimes we apply trust or judgment because of one thing that we disagree with about somebody and and actually try to you know put that as the overarching trust on them completely and just push them off and that really doesn't work that creates major division and conflict and it doesn't actually acknowledge people for who they are because you might have low trust in someone in, you know, a particular sector of relationship, or maybe they are not a great cook or whatever, but they might be amazing as an artist or a physicist or whatever. And if you throw out the gifts they have because of a shadow that they're still processing, mm -hmm. then you're really missing and you're losing the person. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in relationship to what you just shared with me, I, I have this particular, you know, thing where I've had to go about specifically talking with people about their experience to understand what they're capable of understanding, right? To, to understand what they're capable of accepting. Mm -hmm. And I had this opportunity to have dinner with someone. Uh, it was a group of new friends that I met when I was at the Liberties Horizon event in, in San Diego. Mm -hmm. And, um, and this woman brings her boyfriend to dinner and with, with some of her other friends and me. And she's like, oh, you're a physicist. Like, I would love for you guys to talk about the flat earth because her boyfriend had gone down this rabbit hole and he fully believed it. And he just completely gone there and believed that that's the case. So I thought, well, this is going to be fascinating. I want to really just ask this guy questions because I don't want to make him feel bad in front of his girlfriend. I'm not trying to, you know, I, I want to actually get right. to know these people as people, yeah. not just instantly go, oh, he's a flat earther. I'm out of here. You know, like this is BS, mm -hmm. you know, that's just never going to solve any kind of problem. Mm -hmm. And so through the conversation, what I discovered by asking him questions like, have you ever taken a flight in the Southern Hemisphere? Do you understand that if the Earth was a disk, how much longer the flight times would be on the outer rim of the disk in the Southern Hemisphere as it would in the Northern Hemisphere? Um, are you familiar with graph theory and like radial, you know, measurements and mathematics? Have you ever been at the ocean and watched a ship go off of the horizon where you can see its actual structure, you know, going and dipping below the horizon? I asked him all of these different questions and what I realized was that he just didn't have a lot of experience. Right. He didn't have a lot of direct experience right. to be able to apply that experience in his consideration mm -hmm. of these, you know, ideas essentially that, you know, different people came up with because they didn't understand certain science, certain mathematics principles and, or and somewhere. 
And you could also see this deeper underbelly of the distrust for groups like NASA, the distrust for certain, you know, uh, government organizations in particular. Mm. And that is super valid mm. because just like the disclosure project, Stephen Greer, you know, is working on, has been working on since, you know, I met him in 2001 um, and he already had the freaking giant book with like 500 witnesses from CIA, NSA, FBI, et cetera. You know, they've exposed that, yeah, like NASA has been literally editing out spaceships out of photos for decades. Right. They've had to because otherwise the amount of photos that go out, they, the, uh, you know, people will be seeing these things and they'd be like, you know, and they 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 needed to go along with the program. So there's plenty of reasons to distrust the operation of organizations like that. But does that mean that every astronaut's lying? Every pilot is lying? Every, like, do you put that frame on everyone because of that? And that's the same trust problem, right? It's saying, I don't have trust in this sector, but because I don't have trust in this sector, it's going to dominate my perspective and my lens on all the things in that area. Okay. And I think that that's where the heart of war comes from, the heart of cultural conflict, religious war, religious conflict. And this is the subtlety that we're solving with trust graph and with understanding relationships are more dimensional than that. Mm. OK, there you go. There, there you go. A wonderful background on all of that, because um, the implication of like how we perceive reality and how we perceive each other and how we are quick to judge and bad faith assumptions. And, you know, our culture steeps in that sort of yeah. way of orienting. So, so trust graph, and then you, I don't know if you want to say too much about core network and kind of, I love, I love our, like some of the naming you shared with me yesterday like about mm -hmm. Rose. And I'm like, Oh, you know, I, I love yeah. these, 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 because I can feel the vision and the mm. intentionality with upgrading where we currently are with our technology systems. Mm. And you can't like, you know, Einstein says, uh, I think it was him. Some people say not, but um, you can't solve the problem at the level of consciousness that created it. Right. It just, it's, it, you can't, it's kind of like, well, that, that doesn't even how, no, you can't. So, so we've, yeah. we've been in this increase of our, our consciousness awareness and we've been growing and developing. And now we actually, I believe are at this cusp of where we can initiate and activate things like even Barbara's peace yeah. room, which was her vision in 1984. But yeah. when I started working with her in 2005, we were doing peace rooms, but yes, the peace room, but we couldn't, yes. <laughs> I love it. Yes. You wouldn't want to hear, hear you share about that because these dashboards and like how we can track and what our metrics are and how we can make visible things are actually emerging. Like we don't even yeah. in the media, we're surrounded by media that is like mainstream media for the most part telling just distortions of what's possible. Yeah. And we need to know actually what is happening, where the needs are, what's actually working, where things are emerging that are beautiful and how we can nurture them and put attention to them, you know? And so that um, this core of, at the heart of, you know, what's the divisiveness within war? I mean, there's a lot of things to say about it, but it is a perception of the other. So everything you've been speaking about is how to like heal those, that relational field. And also then facilitate more of the awareness of of how we actually are perceiving reality through what lens like we just say oh it's not like throw the baby out with the bathwater, and we can see right. we all do it in some way or another so how is right. the technology going to serve us in that way and then you know give us a peek into the piece for yeah. yeah 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 let's go there yeah. um yeah, so I'll start, I'll still start with Trustcraft because that's where we were. And I'll just kind of tie a nice bow around that and say that, you know, the power of being able to see the energetic dynamics of relationship is what it's actually about. And when you start tracking your energetic relationship with things, you now create what we call in the tech world an index. And the index is essentially the source of a data field that enables you to search and locate what's important inside of that data field, 
right? Do you think of it as the glossary at the back of the book or the index at the back of the book that points you to where everything is? This is for you. Yeah. And it's for you. That's the most important thing is we're talking about agent centric lens. That means the way that I see the world and trust the world is the lens through which my index for search is built, through which my index for relational understanding is built. And it's always going to mirror me. And that can be a teaching tool for me too, because okay. if there's things that I don't have trust in, that I don't know anything about, I can start to actually see where those things are that are not in my trust field at all, that I don't have any knowledge about. So it can also be the source of something that drives you to have inquiry. So Trustgraph solves decentralized search. How do we search with each other when we're not using centralized servers and databases is the big you know, key. It solves things like um, bootstrapping the unbanked, uh, creating reputation and validation systems for everything from people in refugee camps to one of our applications and get help is uh, validation uh, between recovery residences and homeless people where they can cross validate each other. So the homeless person can say, yeah, okay, the food is great here, but these people treat me like junk. And that that can actually become a feedback mechanism to other people. And in certain agreements, those kinds of validations can become useful metrics to organizations and to applications. In other words, to people that want to help make that better. Right. And so you can say in these contexts, my validation, my trust is private. And in these other contexts, my validation is public, meaning I've earned these badges. I've completed these courses. I've been validated as, you know, a person who's gone through addiction recovery. And now I'm in a position where I'm better suited to take on a job. Right. And so there's just this incredible multifaceted field that Trustcraft plays into. But it doesn't do all of that magic alone. Right. And what we realized is that, you know, we're in a situation where our social field is so unbelievably tampered with and screwed. It's it's like insane. Have like have you ever tried searching for who your friends are in certain locations on Facebook? Oh, um, in a sense, they don't make it possible. Yeah. Once you do it, like I, I got I got through searching five locations and they shut off the feature for me. Yeah. They stopped okay. me from taking the, like actually recording who their people are. Oh my God. That's, I'm so happy that you even name it. Now I feel validated because Tibet Sprague has like a trick. He's told it to me. I've had to ask yeah. him several times. He has this, it's a simple trick. And you're like, I, I can never find it again. You know, right. but there is this right. way. And I was like, mm. why don't they do that? That is like a critical feature. Yep. And why can't you take a list of your friends and your that you are your favorites, maybe your closest friends? I think they have that tag on there. Right. Yeah. So why can't you just take your closest friends and just map them on the planet? Yeah. Like, why? Why can't you actually see a map? I mean, Facebook's got the money. They got the servers. They can totally do it. Why not? Well, not the answer to that is the same answer as to why you can't bulk invite people to events as to why nonprofits are throttled at a certain stage. Um, it's all about control of information and thus control of money and control of marketing power, control of networks. And all of these things are just terrible for our ability to coordinate as a collective species. So Core Nexus uh, and what we called Core Network for years, but I've now trademarked Core Nexus, been preparing to release um, in under this brand. Essentially, you can think of it as a 3D social operating system, but that kind of takes all of these massive faults and issues in all of these separate centralized networks and solves them by being integrative, by saying, you know what? No, you, you don't have to just be in Facebook or just be in Instagram. You can take all of your data back from those places. You can visualize that data. You can see, you can see across all of these different networks in one space. You can visualize that data 
any way you want. Like you're not stuck just looking at a, a list or a table or a freaking wall, you know, essentially. Um, but you can look at your, your data in geodesics, in hex grids, in tile form, and you can switch your view based on context and need and including geospatially meaning mapping where things are and what things are on the planet. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, everybody always is like, yeah, but how do you do the economics of that? Do you, you know, advertise to people and, you know, do you take their data and sell it and all of that? And the whole thing is baked on completely flipping the entire script of the old big data market and social media market on its head and saying, you know what, we actually don't need to do any of that unethical operation. Everybody can own their own data. Everybody can own their own control, their own identity. Um, and there's another market that is also huge and great and is growing rapidly. And by the way, it's over twice the size of the big data market and the social media market. And that market is the learning management systems market or the e-learning market. And you know what e-learning market is? It's where people are teaching each other. Mm. It's where people are sharing information with each other. And that space is amazing, right? Because that's life. That's what life is. It's about growth. It's about understanding. And we realized a long time ago that by building education systems, I mean, we built the Resonance Academy for Unified Physics and the Guardian Alliance, and Visionary Arts Academy and Convergence Academy and uh, National Sedation Centers Academy for medical trainings. And in all of these spaces, we realized it's really simple. You just empower people to teach each other and you just take a little transaction fee on that and you support the platform and you support the teachers in delivering their content. You help them market or whatever. And boom, it's amazing. And so we started applying that to this bigger picture and figured out a way to empower people essentially to share their information in entirely new ways, to monetize that information and baked into it. We basically built this mechanism where no matter what you're selling, no matter what you're creating, you can collaborate with others on it. You can have 10 or 50 people being paid automatically whenever they co-create a particular digital product or course or video or film, whatever. All the funding can be distributed automatically and you can have included in it a regenerative impact project donation. And this is this is really the key because this piece says, all right, what if we took everything in our economy, our entire digital economy, which by the way is like almost a trillion dollars, you know, economy right now, just digital products, right? Just digital products. And just these digital products, if everybody just donated some small percentage, 1%, 5%, you know, a few percent here and there, different things, some people doing 50 or 100% into different regenerative impact project sectors. And those impact project sectors These have are commons. This is the commons. Actual, yes, exactly. These commons that have actual people that want to do the work to make the city better. They want to do the work to clean the river. They want to do the work to restore the forest. The, the, the people are there, right? But the funding is not. And the bureaucratic systems are not structured to support this commons mm -hmm. of the people. Mm -hmm. And so what if all of this digital product marketplace network that we had started actually just channeling their own contributions to planetary change and That's transformation. Amazing. Now it's not a central governing entity mm -hmm. saying, oh, you got to owe us taxes or we're not going to take care of your stuff for you, right? Instead, it's all the people saying, well, this is important and not being taken care of. This is important and not being taken care of. Like, these are the things I care about. And I like, I don't want to pay taxes, but I will donate 10% of this album or half of 50% of this album mm -hmm you know, to supporting the cleanup of these rivers. And now you're, you're gamifying this process where people are contributing to the change that needs to happen. They're earning impact tokens, which validate their role as part of these, you know, planetary stewards, essentially. 
And now it's not just about how many likes or how many, you know, whatever you got. It's about how much change you're making by how much service you're doing and the things you're creating. And you know what? It's freaking awesome because as you're doing more service in those ways, you're also making more money. So you're more successful too. And it's not like, you know, you don't have to choose one or another. You can become successful and serve the planet and be a planetary steward at the same time. And so we call that the regenerative operating system experience, which is the rose at the heart of core nexus. The rose at the heart. Regenerative operating system experience. I love that you have experience as intimately interwoven because that's really what it is. That's that kind of leads us into the embodiment piece of it. Is this mm. like, oh, we're not just talking about this. We're actually we're embodying it. I love that. Yes. So Adam, we I know that you have little time left, and I want to make sure that we just close with um as a lot. And I wish we had more time, but I understand you're like launching and lots of big things are happening. And I appreciate your time so much. Mm-hmm. And um yeah, I I think a question that's probably on a lot of people's hearts and minds as they're listening to this is like, when is this coming and going to be uh, available for us and Mm -hmm. and also maybe just a touch on alleviating people's concerns that maybe they're not thinking that they're techy enough to be able to play Mm -hmm. in that way yeah yeah sure thanks um yeah timeline is still a little flexible at the moment I mean, we're ramping and up and scaling right now. Um, we're building a lot of key components. We have a lot of the, the sort of core architecture dialed and a lot of the visualization systems dialed. Uh, it's a huge project though. And, yeah. you know, when you're not, when you don't have a billion dollars to spend like Facebook, you have to work with what you've got. And um, a lot of that's been bootstrapping for years and and building prototypes and components of this thing. Um, but now we have some really amazing partnerships coming in, and some of these partnerships have massive mainstream licensing with certain groups that I can't talk about, but I'll just say that like you know their names, you've already seen you know, media from them, like it's out, it's out there in a big way. And so we, we are preparing this thing in a way to be able to deliver it as large and to as many people as possible. And we have to kind of ninja our way into escape velocity to overcome the resistance of the major platforms that are out there right now that don't necessarily want to see something like this succeed because it's going to kill their whole business, you know? Um, and, you know, I, I, I am not here to be someone like, you know, the guy behind Uber that's trying to go to war with all the mafias and all of the big agencies. I'm not here to go to war. I'm here to build alliances And I believe that the solution to our problems on the planet comes through shifting to how do we synergize? How do we align? How do we transcend and include? How do we acknowledge the gifts of the platforms and the things that have already been here and support what's been created through those things, keep what's being what's valuable and move forward to something better and something different. Mm -hmm. So that's that's really the foundation um, for all of this. And as I said, you know, our work started, my work started with the idea of how do we augment consciousness? How do we empower ourselves to just understand what we're looking at better? Meaning like, you know, if I'm doing a a search on a major search engine and I just get black and white text that I have to scroll through, like I'm not doing any sense making there. I'm just looking at whatever that tells me is the most important things and I'm probably not even going to page two, right? I just think that that's actually the most important thing, but that's not actually reality and that's not truth. Mm -hmm. Um, And I believe that when we start using color harmonics and geometry and things that naturally empower the brain Mm -hmm. to greater comprehension, Mm -hmm. we not only improve our ability to understand and make sense of larger pools of information that we're looking at, but we also make accessible 
navigation of highly complex data and information to kids. Mm -hmm. Like I want kids to be able to literally get on corn access and experience it and go, Oh my gosh, like this is, this is easy. This is so intuitive. Like I can do anything on this thing Mm -hmm. and then be teaching their parents how to do like, you know, what different things can do. Mm -hmm. Um, And, but always design wise, always we're thinking about, you know, how do we make it as simple, user-friendly, easy, Mm -hmm. tactile as Mm -hmm. possible. Mm -hmm. And and so don't, don't worry if you're out there and you're not into tech or you, you know, you have a hard time with Facebook. I have a hard time with Facebook for, you know, like literally I, I like go on like Google. I mean, this is like one of the biggest companies in the world. And I go into their admin interface for, you know, my company and the emails and, and stuff like that. And they like change it all the time and, and hide things inside of other things so much that I literally, I'm like, I don't even know how to operate this. Like I've been, (laughs) I've been building websites for 25 years and I can't even operate this simple Google interface. Like what the, you know, like what is wrong with these people? And it's because it's not coming from first principles. Yeah. It's not coming from understanding of how people actually experience information, mm. how they learn, how their consciousness evolves through learning and experiencing information. Um, and, and I think that those things are really primary to supporting and augmenting the evolution of consciousness on this planet. Mm. Mm. I love that we, that that's our kind of closing frame is, and actually it, I've been having a vision of technology platforms that you would enter into it. And it would be this like harmonic space where your body would be, would be like, Oh, I feel so good here. And Oh, I'm actually seeing more than when I first entered and I'm having more kind of, my body is relaxed. I'm not in like an incoherent field um, Mm -hmm. designed to kind of extract. I'm actually the, the intentionality of the technology is here to serve my own growth in order for me to fulfill my mission and Dharma on the earth. So I, I I love hearing all this. Well, uh, before we close, I have a couple more minutes. Um, I just want to honor Barbara Marks Hubbard for a moment. Let's do it. And, you know, people often ask me about this space behind me and I really like to share with them that this is uh, to me, the embodiment of the peace room that Barbara Marks Hubbard envisioned many years ago. And yeah, it looks like a, you know, it looks like a starship deck essentially, you know, and it has that vibe to it too. But notice that in the center of this thing is earth. And these are all dashboards essentially looking at what's going on in different areas of the planet. Mm -hmm. And to me, this is the key. The key is actually having the virtual as well as in the future physical spaces where we can really see and understand Mm. ourselves as a species on a planet and what we're going through and where our challenges are. Mm. And I want to know where the worst, you know, polluters are on the planet and, and how we can strategically work with those people and those companies to change the way they operate as much as I want to know where forests are threatened or where new forests are being built. And I want to know where the land projects are that are, you know, stimulating regenerative thinking and new ways of gardening and new ways of farming and being together. All of these things are essential points. Mm -hmm. And, and by seeing it in the world, seeing how we're connected to it, seeing how they're connected to each other and being able to actually drive resources and and connect the dots that is the key to planetary stewardship at at large and i think barbara marks hubbard really saw that Mm -hmm. from the beginning and for me i was you know it was in uh 2007 actually i think that i was in the um uh international symposium on digital earth in san francisco and a speaker at the gala dinner there and i met all these people that were passionate about planetary visualization, but not always for necessarily all the right reasons, but I could see that planetary visualization is actually really Mm. so essential 
to us stepping up and being stewards. Um, and I just wanted to honor Barbara for her longtime journey in that and seeing that. And uh, I hope that we can make her vision real and bring forth the synergy engine that helps connect the dots between all of these projects. <laughs> That's so perfect. Yeah, she's just really beaming at the moment because so many of us are our lineage carriers and I, when I met her in 2005, I was, that's what we were working on was the peace room. And we didn't, and then for, until the end, until she passed away three years ago, I, we were looking for the platform, the technology platform for the Synergy Engine. And, yep. you know, we, she knew it was coming. She knew it was coming. She was so ahead of her time. And, you know, and the way she would language it in some ways is like map, track, scan, and connect what's working. And what I really mm -hmm. feel in this whole what you're naming here for this peace room is that we needed a peace room as sophisticated as the war room. And that that is like this shifting consciousness and what you're naming about the, 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 the earth and the center is when we do that, when we can have this kind of experience through technology, cause we can't really yeah. do it ourselves. Like know that we are, well, we can, but, but it's different without the traveling everywhere but you recognize that you're not just a small local self. You're actually mm -hmm. related to every single thing. And we are like one super organism. And when we can see yeah. that we're one super organism, then we have like a, we can actually see more of what is right relationship in, 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 in life. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, Barbara's beaming. This is really good. And um, it's timely, right. And timely. So, so yeah. So good. Um, thank you, Adam. This thank is great. You, thank, you, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And I look forward to the next time we get to speak. Me too. Thank you so much. It's been an honor and a pleasure. And thank you to everyone listening in. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Stay tuned for uh, next week's episode. <laughs>